Good evening. This is Mike Manjos, Chairman of the Board of Finance. Today is April 23rd, 2020. It is 7.01 p.m. This is a public hearing to receive input on the fiscal year 2021 budget of the Town of Monroe. Other than Board of Finance members, everybody is currently joined in listen-only mode. Please allow me to confirm the presence of those Board of Finance members. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Otoshevsky. Here. Greg Hirsch. I don't Craig, believe, can you hear us? I don't believe Craig was making this call. Ah, okay. Rebecca O'Donnell? Rebecca is here. Uh, Dean? Stavney? Getting better. President? Steve Kirsch? I'm here. And uh, Mike Manjos, I hereby declare a quorum and call this meeting to order. I would also like to recognize and confirm that we also have First Selectman Ken Cullig present. Kellogg here. Town Attorney Frank Lito. Present. Okay. I hereby appoint Town Attorney Frank Lito as parliamentarian of this public hearing. Should any questions arise regarding the procedures or conduct of this meeting, a copy of the agenda and any related materials have been posted and can be found on the Town of Monroe's website, www.monroect.org, for public inspection. <clears throat> Please allow me to first provide an introduction regarding this public hearing. This public hearing is being conducted remotely in compliance with Section 1 of Governor Mont's Executive Order 7B, dated March 14, 2020, using freeconferencecall.com conferencing technology. Using this technology, the public shall participate in real time by a telephone using the access information set forth on the meeting agenda. Notice is hereby given that only 1,000 participants may access this remote public hearing at one time. Access to this meeting using this technology is granted solely by the technology provider on a first access basis and is not controlled by the Town of Monroe. While it is anticipated that we would not exceed this participation limit for this meeting, should it appear we are approaching said limit, so as many members of the public is denied access to this meeting, the chairman retains the right to adjoin the meeting, continue at a later date using technology appropriate to ensure all members of the public may participate. Please take note of the following regarding this remote electronic public hearing. This meeting is being conducted in real time. This meeting is open to the public, that any member of the public may listen to this anonymously. That this meeting is being recorded, and while you have joined in listen-only mode, once recognized to speak, anything you say may become part of the recording. That the recording shall be posted within the town website within seven days. That the recording shall be made available within a reasonable amount of time in town hall or upon public request. I will be opening the lines for real public participation input. However, prior to doing so, I will first read into the record all written submissions that have been received by the Board of Finance as of 6 p.m. this evening. Let me just verify the number here. I don't see any new ones, so we have 35 submissions, so please be patient while I read them. Once I have completed this process, I will be opening the lines for anyone who wishes to speak. Uh, there are no further written submissions in my possession as of 6 p.m. this evening. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm going to read each item now. I'll jump back. All right. Here we go. Uh, first is from John Peterson, 405 Fan Hill Road. Cut spending by reducing teachers' salaries, please, for the love of God. Short and sweet. Uh, the second one is Brian Young. Uh, does not have the address, but I will read it in. Cap the increase at the 2019 inflation rate of 2.3%. The current situation affecting retail, travel, and hospitality will eventually roll into the financial and manufacturing sectors and then real estate. The simple existence of a situation where the budget does not get an actual voter referendum should be enough to warrant caution. <clears throat> Cutting the increase in half is still an increase, but demonstrates an understanding of the economic situation and our future economic peril. Uh, next is from Marita Mendez to Veta, 871 Main Street. That was sent directly to Mr. Kellogg. To whom it may concern, Mr. Kellogg, since I received your code red message, it began to concern me in regards to my town's current budget situation. I ask that you consider not raising taxes because this would negatively impact the taxpayer as well as Monroe local businesses. 
My family and I have been living in Monroe for 10 years now and are looking to buy another home in Monroe. However, if this negativity impacts the buyer-seller market, we would move to another nearby town. I would ask that you consider input from what's best for the town. Regards. Uh, this is from Barbara Farr, 233 Meadows End Road. Good afternoon. There were challenging times more than any of us would have anticipated only a few short months ago when we began our annual budget cycle. I do not envy the position of any of you are now experiencing as a result of COVID-19 and the national world response to its effect on society and roles of leaders during this time. As I understand it, your team will be responsible for settling the Town of Monroe budget for the next fiscal year. As such, I would ask that you not just move forward with the budgets created by the Board of Ed and Selectmen pre-COVID-19. It simply no longer reflects an accurate description of the revenues the town can, should expect from businesses in the residential base. We will lose business. We will see residential defaults on taxes owed in greater percentage than ever before. I personally believe that as a community, our town needs to revisit the nice-to-haves like the pool, class, small class size, and capital projects that are currently moving through approvals and maybe even make some very controversial decisions about schools and town services. We cannot simply as a community expect to think that the budget sitting before you is responsible giving the massive unknowns of COVID-19. I don't know what the right number is, but giving the anticipated 30% unemployment rate being used by federal leaders the day over day losses within the stock market and pending federal stimulus package of $2 trillion as an indicator. We just don't know how bad the economic impact will be. Therefore, I would ask that you consider an earnest putting in forth an expenditure budget for our next fiscal year is significantly reduced, taking a stab in the dark, uh, maybe as low as 65% of what the town council sent over to your team for action. If I am mistaken, there are provisions that would allow the town to revisit the spending plan at a later date if the financial impact is less severe than anticipated, like six months into the fiscal year. Thank you for listening. Good luck, and I trust you will be, continue to be fiscally responsible with all our community in mind. Uh, <clears throat> next one is from uh, Pat O'Hara. Uh, do not have an address on this one, but... We will read it in. Dear Chairman Manjos and members of the Board of Finance, as Treasurer of the Town of Monroe, I offer the commentary with respect to investment revenue anticipated in the fiscal 2021 budget. The stiff rate created cratered in reaction to the Fed's cutting interest rates to zero. The stiff rate has historically lagged such Fed action on March 24th. The rate was 0.87, having been in the area of 1.6 for January through March. Expect the rate to continue to shrink the year's progress. <clears throat> During the 2007-2008 uh, financial crisis, the stiff rate lagged about 18 months before falling between 0.10 and 0.25 for five years. Today, we case a price of crisis that is staggeringly different. Just yesterday, there were negative yields in U.S. Treasury bonds. A $2 trillion stimulus package is about to be approved by Congress and unemployment expected to hit 30%. I suggest the board finance said investment income for fiscal 2021 at zero. This is not to say there won't be some investment in income. We have one investment with Jenny Montgomery Scott, which ought to provide 30 to 40,000 for the year, as long as the mortgages invested in aren't cashed in sooner than anticipated. If there is an early redemption, we will get our capital back to invest in the Steve, but lose the revenue. Stiff rates, if they follow what they did during the 2007-2008 crisis, we'll probably get to 0.1 to 0.25 level. If town is unable to collect taxes from unemployed residents and close businesses, there will be that income as well. I have reached out to Jenny Montgomery Scott, advisor Carolyn Frizop, to look into alternatives. Unfortunately, alternatives might include holds of six months or a year, which I don't believe at this time liquidity for income. I will continue to advise the board as events transpire. Uh, the next is from Samantha Sims, 136 Swenson Road. Mr. Kellogg, I hope that you and your family are well. I know that this is a trying time, but I wanted to reach out to you about the budget. I saw that governor has given Connecticut towns the opportunity to pass their budgets without the usual referendum process. This is a bit concerning to me. I follow the budget proceedings pretty closely, as well as the members of our community's reaction to the proposed budget. The proposed $2.5 million increase in the Board of Ed budget for next year was not sitting well with many of the members of our community, and I'm very confident it would not have passed the initial referendum vote. 
This would have required the Board of Ed to go back and make cuts to the large increase of its budget. However, now that that process would not occur, I am concerned that the previous $500,000 cut that you made to the Board of Ed's proposed budget will somehow make it back into the budget since you no longer need to appease the voters. The referendum process is essential to the town and I fear the consequences of doing it away with it even for this one year. My husband has lived in Monroe for 17 years. I have been here for nine. Our daughter attended Stephanie STEM and graduated from Massac last year. Our family is invested in the town. We supported you and your Republican ticket. I am hopeful that this global crisis is not used as an excuse to take away our town, say in our town, to push through an inflated budget and further increase taxes for hard week working, dedicated members of the community. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. All right, next one is Sally Perusi, 205 Cottage Street. I would have voted no for the budget referendum. I feel the increase is too high. <clears throat> now that with what's going on and so many people out of work, myself included, I feel it would be a huge mistake to approve the current proposal. If any budget is approved, it should be a zero increase. Yes, we will go through this, but no one knows when. I sincerely hope our town has more common sense than our federal government has and acts responsibly in regards to this budget. Next one is Rick uh, Zaleski. 169 Cottage. Uh, even commercial financial institutions are instituting breaks for those impacted by COVID-19 and the various measures taken because of it. Many of us can have barely afford to, the taxes as it is. In face of the current crisis, we need a tax reduction, not an increase. Next is from Virginia Scope. Uh, too, too high of a hike in this economic downturn. Many businesses, blue collar, and craft people have lost jobs. The education budget supports teachers that did not face these challenges. Represent the community now by not driving up additional expenses. Uh, the next one is from Laura Tevetter, 240 Shelton Road. No increase. Short and sweet. Uh, the next is from Karen Gallagher, 1065 Monroe Turnpike. It is time to find other ways to get money into town. Homeowners cannot continue with the increases, get rid of unnecessary items, and have a 1% increase. Also, how can the town do more for seniors and low-income residents, cap taxes at 10% of their income, question mark. People who have owned their houses for years and make forty or $50,000 can't afford 9000 in taxes and shouldn't be forced to move. Uh, next is from Chris Gallo. 155 Hammertown Road. Will taxes be lowered now? A few months of government buildings and schools should save millions. Hope it comes back to us, the taxpayers. Please explain if our taxes will not be lowered. The next is from Jessica Katsuka, 62 Blanket Meadow. To whom it may concern, please pass the current budget as is. The current level of funding for the Board of Ed is not sufficient, and further cuts to education will be extremely detrimental. To our school system, passing the budget at the current level would be the least the Board of Finance could do to keep the education system afloat. Our teachers are doing an amazing job of educating our children during our global pandemic. Our kids do not need further trauma by reducing funding and causing teacher layoffs. This pandemic will be emotionally traumatizing for the school-aged children in our community. They will need counselors and small class sizes when they eventually return to normal classes. Please fund the schools appropriately. Next is Patty Fogel, 20 Williams Road. I feel the board should not increase the mill rate, even better, perhaps lower it. During this time of pandemic, many people are now out of work and the future looks bleak for jobs. People are having to adjust their household budgets and remove want items, wish items, and even some necessities. It is time for the board to do the same. With schools out for two and a half months, there should be some savings in utilities and even school supplies. Some petitions may need to be eliminated combined. An increase in our taxes at this time would be perceived as a slap in the face to all residents of Monroe. Uh, next is from Suzanne Wright, 120 Harvester Road. A 4% increase in taxes is outrageous at this time. Uh, the steep increase is going to uh, put many families over the edge. You need to find areas to cut. I have lived here for almost 20 years and have seen the town resist economic growth with denying big businesses to come and support our tax base. 
Now we as taxpayers must bear the burden. Monroe hasn't grown and will become a town of not only having a reputation of empty storefronts, get shuttered homes and losing real estate values. Cut that budget. Next is Don Schmelden, 331 Purdy Hill Road. I believe there is no need to raise taxes this fiscal year with the situation now with COVID-19, people out of work just struggling to make ends meet. Shelton isn't raising taxes this year. The BOE gets enough money. Tired of paying high taxes in this town. Next is Bill and Jean Janice Sweet, 24 Captain's Hill Road. Considering the mild winter and the coronavirus issue, please reconsider the budget increase. Some of us are now living paycheck to paycheck. Some, not all of us, have been laid off from their jobs. We moved to Monroe 18 years ago and have seen the mill rate increase year after year with no additional services. We are close to retirement age and will not be able to remain in town as we will not be able to afford the taxes. These past months have been trying for all of us. Please think about the citizens of Monroe that are affected by the virus situation. We don't know when we'll be able to get to any type of normalcy and go back to work. Thank you for your consideration. The next one is Evelyn Nash, 23 Pheasant Lane. Please consider a no increase in taxes just for this year in light of the financial upheaval for many residents due to COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, Mary Alice Citrano. A mill rate increase in these difficult times will be the ruination of our town. The company, uh, community is suffering along with our entire state. Each year, the mill rate is increased or adjusted. Our property taxes are currently close to being unaffordable. Any increase will make it more difficult to afford and impossible to sell. We do not want to leave Monroe, but it may be time to cut our losses. It would be wise under the extenuating circumstances to hold any increases until next year. This is so much ahead of us, remains to be unseen. Next is Elizabeth Catterson. 207 Wingate Circle, please do not raise taxes, especially during these troubled times with loss of jobs. Monroe is one of the highest tax towns in Connecticut, if not the highest tax town in the state. Next is James Williams, 65 Millbrook Terrace. I agree with First Selectman Kellogg. This is not a time to have a budget increase. The Board of Ed will need to bring its budget within line with a 0% increase for the coming fiscal year. John Campos, 16 Monter Drive. My recent property tax revaluation increased my tax burden by 4.5%. Now my mill rate is going to increase another 2.6%. That's a total tax increase of 7.1%. People may not be aware that the average real estate value for the town is about 2.5%, which makes a total tax increase of about 5.1%. A 5% tax increase is not acceptable. Did the town explain to its people that hidden property increase would be an average of 2.5 on top of the 2.6%? Ron Delicato, 73 Evergreen Lane. I'm in full support of holding off raising tax increases considering the current COVID-19 crisis. I also strongly suggest this is an ideal time to have spending evaluated through my husband's business. I believe he has touched base with you. Now is a critical time for this evaluation. I look forward to hearing from you. Stay well. Uh, the next is from Tom Wyszynski, 60 Twin Brooks Lanes. I am shocked to read that our Board of Education requested a 4.88% increase. I implore you to consider the serious position of taxpayers and not increase our taxes. Next is Lee Hostler, 272 Stanley Road. Ken, thank you for consideration of the aging population in Monroe, plus the virus attack which has caused everyone in Monroe. Much appreciated. Uh, the next one is Mary Jane Szczesnowski, uh 65 Hammertown Road. I am writing with great concerns for the upcoming budget. First, let me say that I do appreciate the first selectman and his wish not to increase taxes for the year. In times like this, when many people have lost their jobs and many people have lost their savings, retirement, 401ks, no one needs to have the added burden of coming up with more money for their tax bill in July. My concern is the power-hungry few will decide the budget and thus increase in taxes are only going to do what they have wanted to do for many years. In Monroe, where we still have the option to vote on a proposed budget, we had the ability to keep things in check. 
the right to not watch over our taxes go way out of control, to not allow a few people to decide how much our taxes will go up is a big mistake. In addition, the school system completely ignored the budget given to them last year, and this year they spent $2 million more than they were allowed to. We, the taxpayers, had to suck it up and come up with the money. I do not think the superintendent of Monroe School System is entitled to such a large salary. We all have to live within a budget, and we should not have to bail out our school system when they ignore the budget voted on by the people of the town. Those who are responsible for the overspending by $2 million should have the responsibility for their action. Those who decided, well, they already went ahead and spent the money, so we have to come up with the deficit to cover it. Now we're going to be allowed to choose how much to raise our taxes in the next year. This is a big, big mistake. I fear our first selectman will be held liable for any increase in taxes, and he may not be reelected in the future. He is really good at his job, and I hope he sticks to his comments about not raising the budget and taxes this year. Don't let them push you into going along with their dream year when they can do whatever they want. It will cost all of us more. Uh, Next one uh, is from Nicholas Kapoor, 109 Meadows End Road. In recent years, the inclusion of an economic development coordinator in our town's annual budget has been one of contention and partisanship. We have not had an economic development coordinator in Monroe for over a decade. However, I am hoping we can put partisan aside and make a positive, strategic, long-term decision for our town and include the position in the budget this year. I understand that advocating for adding new staff to our municipal payroll can be construed as misguided at this time of financial panic in our society. But as a town, we need to be ready to rebound from the pandemic. Like every other town and every other state in our country, we run the risk of local businesses shuttering their doors and not having the means to reopen again. Congress has been attempting to decrease the rate of business closures by instituting programs such as the Paycheck Protection Plan and increasing funding for the Economic Injury Disaster Program. But even still, that may not be enough. As the pandemic subsides, Monroe needs to be rebuilding its economy along with other towns. Having a professional on staff who is trained and well-versed in municipal economic development will be an invaluable asset at a time when other municipalities who already have an economic development will be rebuilding and reopening. Other towns will try to make their town the most attractive for a new business to be created or a shuttered business to reopen. Even before the coronavirus pandemic, Monroe was lagging behind its neighbors concerning economic development. <coughs> Trumbull, Newtown, Shelton all have professional economic development staff, and their towns show it. Shelton is completely rebuilding its downtown. Trumbull is building a new plaza on White Plains Road, among other housing construction. And Newtown continues to develop and bring in new business. Weenmile in Monroe, all it takes is a drive up and down Route 111 and 25 to see sign after sign showing rent for available for lease. On 111 from the Trumbull line up to Monroe Elementary, a one-mile stretch of road, there are 11 of those signs. The density of signs on 25 is even higher. Bringing in new business and helping those who close reopen helps our town and our taxpayers by increasing the grant list. An increased grant list can decrease the tax burden on homeowners by shifting it to business that are injecting life into our local economy. We can be much more proactive at attaching business to our town on its commercial corridors with someone who is trained in doing this on the town staff. The Economic Development Coordinator would also be able to apply for grants to increase our revenues and continue to shift tax burden away from homeowners. I still believe that Monroe leaves hundreds of thousands on the table each year by not applying for more grants at the state and federal level. This is no one's fault. How can we expect our department heads to apply for grants when they have so much on their plates already from the day-to-day operation of the departments? Further, individual department heads may not know how to go about writing and applying for grants. Again, this is no fault of their own, I am sure, but I would conjecture that their ability to write and apply for grants is not a requirement of the job description of most of our department heads. Also, my comments are in no way so a slight to our dedicated volunteers of the Economic Development Commission. The members of the commission are true public service who are active in our community and give their time to volunteer to make Monroe better, but they are volunteers. Volunteers can never replace a staff person. Economic development seems to be one of, if not the only department where we expect a volunteer board to take the place of a staff member. We do not have the Parks and Recreation Committee running the Parks and Rec Department. We do not have Board of Health running the Health Department. We do not have the Commission on Aging running the Department of Social and Senior Services. Yet, at your budget meeting, it was the Economic Development Commission Chair who aptly and professionally answered questions on the Economic Development Budget. 
we need to bring Monroe into the 21st century. We need to make Monroe competitive for business compared to other towns in our immediate region so that we can begin to shift the tax burden away from homeowners, increase our grant list, and make our town more affordable to live in while maintaining our award-winning schools. We need to apply for more grants to increase our revenue. We need to give the townspeople more opportunity to buy local and have businesses located in a town that can cater to their needs. We need to be ready to get our local economy bustling and active. This pandemic has gripped our nation. This process can begin with the hiring of an economic development coordinator who has the knowledge, experience, and foresight to make Monroe competitive and attract business to our town. I would strongly ask you to consider including this position in the town's 21 budget. All right. Next is Anne Diato, 7 Osborne Lane. Hello, I am writing to express my thoughts about the mill rate taxes not to be increased at a time when many in town will struggle to make payments. I believe that would eventually lead to many delinquencies and potential loss of homes and security. Those losses will eventually translate to more losses for the resale market and property values. In general, I can go on about how such a drastic increase in particular would negatively impact many, but I hope it isn't necessary and the Board of Finance recognizes increasing taxes will not benefit anyone. Thank you. Margaret Lewis, 253 Porters Hill. I find right now it would be a terrible hardship to raise taxes. We have lived in town for almost 42 years, and as senior citizens find it increasingly hard to live in this town financially, I agree with the selectmen that this year the increase should not be approved. Deborah Skovic, 7 Tanglewood Circle. I would have voted no for the budget referendum because the increase is too high. Now that I can't vote due to Governor Lamont's executive order, there should be no increase in the budget, especially in light of the current pandemic. Please show common sense and act responsibly. Thank you. And the next is from Ronald Magus, uh, 22 Holly Lane. I am very much opposed to what the governor is trying to do here when it comes to town budgets. He does not and should not have the power to take away the rights from the vote of the people. Men and women over the years in this country have fought and died for this right to stay alive. In this day and age we live, technology allows us to vote. At the very least, there should be a drop box at each voting location with a monitor watching over. I know I speak for many in this town that are very much against the select few voting on behalf of me, us. Also, during this rough economic time, no taxes should be raised, and we should keep the budget levels where they have been or even cut areas that can be. Uh, the next uh, came in as just a Maria uh, and did not have Maria Santo, sorry, Elaine, uh, but did not come through. So hopefully we can reach out again. Uh, same thing on Andrea Broderick, Six High Ridge. Uh, nothing came loaded through. Uh, next is Alan Vagliavello, 25 School Street. We developed our budget request pre-pandemic. We certainly do not have provisions for curriculum catch-up or special ed costs to make up for reduced services during distance learning. Providing for those items will be difficult if our funding is cut dramatically. Some learning is loss is likely, but it will vary. Schools are set to stay closed longer than the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. After Katrina, children came back on average more than two years below grade level, some much more. Losses were most dramatic in mathematics. In addition, it often took multiple years of individualized attention to resolve the largest learning losses. Learning losses don't just disappear with one course or in one academic year. While it may be easier to listen to the loudest voices in the room, I hope you will consider the implications large scale cuts will have on educational programming and student outcomes. And the last one I have is from Charlie Belinsky, 358 Wheeler Road. The idea if raising the mill rate and assessment rate together will discourage business as well as attracting buyers from sellers of their properties. Buyers do look at the mill rate and assessment. Monroe is one of the highest mill rates in Connecticut. This is a huge mistake. And that is all I have that was sent in uh, by 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, we do encourage people to send in again. Uh, we will be doing this again uh, at the later date. Uh, Ken, do you want to uh, start with the people called in? Uh, sure, Mike. Before you do that, could you just read the instructions? Uh, I got another one. Hold on. Just so that people know how the uh, instructions will be provided to them. Page three. Okay. Okay. 
All right. There are no further written suggestions in my possession. I want to remind everybody we will continue to receive written input um, that we plan to conduct in May. Before I open the lines, please note the following. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive public input in the fiscal 2021 budget. Please limit your comments to this subject. Please begin your comments by clearly stating your name and address with spelling for the record. Once I open the phone lines, the standard recording will state the question and answer session has started. Please be clear that this is when you will be able to indicate your desire to speak. However, it is not a question and answer session. We invite you to provide your comments. However, please do not expect the board to answer questions at this time. Once we open the session, you'll be prompted to enter a six on your phone to indicate your desire to speak. You will then be placed on a list. When it is your turn, you will hear a recording that your line has been unmuted and please ask your question. This is the indication it's your time to speak. Okay, I will now ask the phone lines be open for those wishing to speak. We will wait a couple minutes to gather the list and I'll ask the first selectman to confirm once we're ready to begin. Hold on one second. Well, having a problem here. Hold on. Oh, technology. Mike, can you still hear me? Mike, can you hear me? All right, I'm not sure if anyone can hear me, but we do have two people in the queue. I did show 40 people total participants on this call, uh, two people in the queue, and I will start the questions now. Hi, everybody. Jen Aguilar, 32 Surrey Lane. I don't have a question. I don't know why it's prompting for a question, but um, I just have a statement. I just wanted to thank everybody for all your hard work. And I also wanted to um, get on the record that uh, I am town council member. I, I have um, nothing to say um, about the budget right now, but I do would like the public to know, I would like the Board of Finance to make the public aware that because of revals, if we do have a 0% increase, that that doesn't mean your taxes won't go up a little bit because you do have a property reval also to consider. Um, and also that hopefully if this gets, if everything gets better, that this would be a one-off at 0%. Thank you. Thanks everybody. I don't know how to end. Thank you. We'll go Ken, to the next. To... Yep. We'll, you'll okay. uh, be muted again in a second. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, you'll okay. be open momentarily. Hi, yes, this is Bonnie Maurer, M A U R, 97 Bug Hill Road. How's everybody tonight? I um, really just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, I think Jen made a good point just now about the reevaluation issue, and I recognize what a difficult time you all are having now, having to make decisions for the town in a very difficult time for everybody. And I want to thank you all for the work that you're doing. 
at the same time, I also want to uh, make a couple of comments about the fact that I have lived in town for almost 40 years now. I've watched the town grow. I would love to see the town grow more. And I think that comment before, I believe it was by Nick Kapoor about an economic, an economic development commissioner, was a solid point. Uh, at the same time, I want to say that I'm concerned about the fact that uh, the selectman has proposed utilizing so much of the general fund. I'm um, concerned that we used it last year. Now we're using it again this year. And I'm wondering where that leaves us. If we, even if that takes us to a 0% increase this year, where does that leave us next year? I'm more concerned that then we will have a huge tax increase, one that uh, many people will not be able to afford. Uh, I also want to make the point that I believe that uh, with schools having closed, the Board of Ed de deficit is being covered largely by that. I did sit in on the board meeting the other night, and I um, am concerned that then none of the cuts that people thought were going to be made will ultimately be made because of the fact that deficit, the deficit's been closed. And if we just pass the budget through, We'll have, a, we'll have a too large an increase next year. So, um, because then we'll have to cover those expenses yet again with, uh, with additional ones for the following year. Um, so, thank you very much for allowing me to have my say, and I wish you all luck in making a decision. Thank you. I show an additional uh, person who has uh, indicated a desire to speak. Please hold on. Hey, Ken, it's Chris Kreis, uh, 29 Birds I Read. Um, my question for you, just is there a reconciliation, I haven't seen it, I might have missed it, between the actual proposed spending increase and how much you plan to use from the general fund? Because the, the proposed increase in spend to me looked less than the proposed usage of the general fund, so I'm just trying to understand how you gap that. You know, I see a $3.7 million change in spend, I think, on the latest. And I thought the numbers were like a six and a half million usage of the general fund. So if someone reconciling that, will you be publishing that? Thanks. Thank you for the uh, rules of this uh, public hearing. We're not able to answer questions at this time, but I know that uh, Chairman Manjos is listening and will take your question. I'm sure he will, uh, we will find a way to get back to you. Uh, thank you. Are there, if there are any other uh, participants wishing to speak at the public hearing, please press star six on your phone. I see an additional person who has indicated a desire. Stand by. Good evening, everybody. Jason Maurer, 44 Stable Ridge Road, also town councilman. Uh, thank you, everybody, for all of your work on this. Uh, I've mentioned my position in the council meetings for the past couple of years about usage of our surplus funds, our undesignated fund balance. Uh, certainly, it, this is our rainy day fund, and this is certainly our rainy day. Uh, I would just be aware of the exponential increase, as I've stated in past years, that could come as a result of using too much of this, especially as we attempt to rebuild those funds in order to maintain our bond rating. Uh, the other item that I would like to discuss is actually an increase in our capital side of our budget uh, for our roads. Considering the extremely low bond uh, rates right now, it is a time to increase our appetite and bonding for things such as building our roads. My suggestion would be for the next two years, and obviously we can reevaluate next year depending on how bond rates continue at that point, to increase our amount from 1 million to 2 million, and then for the following four years, decrease down to $500,000 per year. It would create a zero net about on the amount that we are actually borrowing, and we can take advantage of the low bond rates that are available right now, as well as increase the amount of roads we are able to do in the current years, uh, taking advantage of lower pricing because the pricing for uh, the construction as well as for the asphalt continues to go up and up and up each year. So we would actually save money in the long run without borrowing any additional money over a six-year period. Uh, best of luck with everything to the Board of Finance. 
as well as to all of our town officials. I know things have been rough, and I look forward to continuing to work with everybody to putting forward a budget that hopefully everybody in town can uh, be okay with, especially considering everything going on. Have a good one, everybody. Thank you. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak, please press star six on your phone. Again, one last time, last call. Anyone who wishes to speak, please press star six on your phone. I see one person who has indicated, stand by. Uh, good evening. Go ahead, your line's open. Okay, good. So my name's Gordon Cleland. I live at 65 Beach Tree Lane in Monroe. Um, and I'm here, um, I'm a tax lawyer and former CPA, uh, educated at uh, NYU, a Master of Laws and Tax Program. And I'm here to support the zero tax increase budget. But I would have been here anyway without the pandemic um, because I think that uh, the town through its, its uh, budgets has created a lot of value destruction uh, as a result of, and it's something that residents of Monroe are no longer in a position to tolerate. So I've lived in Monroe since 2001. I bought a home, a brand new home, uh, at a cost of around $600,000, improvements of $30,000. Today, best case, on a notional basis, I would probably break even around $630,000. But as all uh, members of the Board of Finance must know, there would be a, a large economic loss um, as a result of uh, inflation. My economic loss would probably exceed $200,000. Put another way, $630,000 in 2020 is worth a lot less than $630 in 2001 uh, when I bought the home and moved here. No one in Monroe should, should put up with this type of value destruction, even if the person, other residents would be, could, could be considered lifers in Monroe. You'd want to have this flexibility to be able to move to other parts of the country and maintain value. So how would, you con how would, you, how would we avoid continued value destruction in Monroe? Obviously, a lot of uh, this phenomenon is a, is, is a result of state policies, which are not in the purview of local government. As I'm sure most of you know, Connecticut polls very poorly in terms of being one of the highest uh, the states with the highest percentage of people wanting to leave and the state, one of the states with the lowest percentage of people wanting to move in. And there's very, we've functionally had a zero population growth uh, in Connecticut for a long time. Um, as I said, we can't, as a local level, change any of these state policies, but we can control the growth of our property tax. We can't change things like distance from New York City, which is obviously a factor in terms of competition with other uh, jurisdictions in Fairfield County. So just giving you an example of what I talk about when I talk about value destruction and property taxes, I'll use my own case. July two, 2001, the first installment that I paid in Monroe, I paid $4,222. July 2019, 18 years later, I paid $8,670. That's a 105% increase. Using the rule of 72s, that's a 4% per annum increase in property taxes per annum approximately. Clearly that rate exceeds the national rate of inflation for 2001 to 2020 on, a, on an average uh, annual basis. And during that time, the number of students in our Monroe educational system 
has substantially decreased. We are constantly hearing arguments in support of budgets based upon necessity of supporting our schools. To me, that's a specious argument, or at least at this time it is. The reason it is is because prospective buyers don't even get to the point of considering that issue because our taxes are so high that most buyers are priced out of our market. They just can't afford to live here. I'll give you another example coming from uh, the time when I moved from New York, from, uh, from Manhattan. I did not spend a lot of time looking at Scarsdale with its great schools because I simply could not afford to live there. So to me, it's fallacious to believe that pouring more money into our schools will make us much, so much better than other Fairfield County neighbors so that pr prospective buyers will only want to live here and not live in, in our rival jurisdictions like Easton or Newtown. We'll always be, it'll always be a competitive situation here where most of the towns in Fairfield County will have good educational systems. To make Monroe a valuable place to live in, we must control our taxes annually. It must be the number one priority of the first selectman, town council, board of finance, to have as close as we can to 0% increase in taxes on an annual basis. Then buyers will return to Monroe. Thank you. Thank you. If there's anyone else who would like to speak, please press star six on your phone. Again, if there's anyone else who wishes to speak, this is a last call. Please press star six. I see one person who has indicated a desire to speak. Stand by. This is Paul Huber, 559 Pepper Street. Maintaining the present funding of education in Monroe is essential, as Monroe needs to continue to support STEM and robotics, taking in consideration then that Connecticut is one of only 23 states who maintain STEM programs and one of 30 states who support robotics. Technology-related education is essential for a great future of our students. That's all I have to say. Thank you. We have another speaker. Please stand by. Go ahead. Your line is Hello. up. Hi, this is uh, Nick Sentimentus, 38 Highfield Drive. Uh, my question is, I wanted to get an idea of the town's uh, liquidity position. I know uh, other towns and even companies are making changes to, uh, you know, staffing levels and, uh, you know, uh, trying to generate some liquidity and reduce some expenses. What's the town doing during this time in that regard? Okay, thank you. As the chairman had indicated earlier, uh, they're unable to answer questions during the public hearing portion, but I'm sure they will address them either in a meeting or offline. Uh, is there any other comments you wish to say during the public hearing? No, I was, there. I was just curious what the town was doing in terms of, uh, you know, reducing expenses and kind of trying to conserve conserve liquidity. Understood. Important questions. They uh, unfortunately do not want to entertain questions during the public hearing, but I'm sure they will address them uh, subsequently. Thank you. That's that's fine. Okay. Thank you. I see another person who's indicated a desire to speak. Stand by. Hi, um, my name is April Mignon. I live on um, 40 Crestwood Road. Um, I joined the meeting kind of late, but I had um, 
I wanted to know with uh, COVID-19, um, as far as next year goes, is the school uh, system implementing a plan in case this returns, like um, increasing um, or decreasing class sizes and providing um, more intervention um, teachers to address the gap that will most likely occur from um, distance learning? Okay, thank you. Uh, I will again uh, ask that either the Board of Finance or Board of Education uh, follow up offline. Uh, again, this is a public hearing. The, the chair has indicated that uh, they are unable to answer questions during the public hearing portion. Uh, did you have any other comments but, you wish to say? Okay, I, I'm just, I just, that's a valid concern as a parent. Um, and I feel like the money should be put into um, into the schools and making sure that classroom sizes are smaller than having 24 kindergarten, kindergartners or first graders in, um, in a grade, especially with uh, the possible return of COVID-19 in the fall and winter months next school year. Okay, thank you. If there's anyone else who wishes to speak in the public hearing, please press star six on your phone. Again, if there's anyone else who wishes to speak, this will be a last call. Please press star six on your phone. Okay, I see no other indications of anyone wishing to speak. Uh, I'm going to resume the perfect right. on behalf of the uh, entire Mr. board of finance. I'd like to thank everybody for their input. This Mr. board Major? certainly appreciates hearing. Yep. I'm sorry. Before can you hear me? You, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I can. Before you conclude, I, I would just ask if you just kind of recap for those uh, individuals that uh, did respond with questions. I understand that's what the recording said, but they may have missed your earlier uh, introduction. I certainly don't want folks to believe that there was not a desire to answer their questions. It just simply wasn't the uh, forum. So if you would. No, it's not the format for it, but I mean, exactly. Address, Anybody uh, who can email on the, uh, send directly on the email comments. Um, and it's on the website, you can reach out and I respond to every email that comes in. So I will happily respond to any questions that come in via email. And for those that did have a, uh, a question during the meeting, we could certainly, uh, via the recording, attempt to uh, find contact information and, and have uh, someone get back to them as well. Terrific. Okay, thank you. Okay. Your meeting. On behalf of the entire Board of Finance, I thank everyone for the input. This board certainly appreciates hearing everyone's perspective and we'll take this under consideration as we continue to do our budget meetings and deliberate on a final budget. I hereby declare this public hearing adjourned at 7.54.